and welcome to the latest episode of Indie Cider, where we are playing Max Gentleman from the Men Who Wear Many Hats. This is a hats production, an arcade-style Victorian manor simulator, which is really hard to describe, so I'm glad we have a video to show it to you with. This game was released in August for Mac, PC, and Linux via Steam, and Android, and iOS. It was funded on Kickstarter. Full disclosure, I was a Kickstarter backer, but the game is a free download. It was not provided to me but for review or backing purposes. And it is making its money through DLC, or in-app purchases, which I have not indulged in. This game was also from the same company that made Oregon Trail, a zombie version of the Apple II classic edutainment title, Oregon Trail. I also backed that project on Kickstarter. Let's check out the options. You can change your input. I'm going to be using the default keyboard. I've had some trouble getting my wireless Xbox 360 controller adapter to work, which is a shame because the first time I played this game was actually in an arcade cabinet, a coin-op with a joystick and buttons, and I did much better with that setup. And the rest of everything I'm going to leave the same. I'm done. And let's go ahead to play. I've been playing this a little bit, so I've unlocked some stuff. I'm pretty sure I need to start with score attack when I first played it. Here's where you choose which Victorian era character you want to play as with uh, some pectoral muscles there. You can play as a, uh, is that Dog or just a Corgi? Octodad, a bear. Other characters are available through DLC. Uh, let's just go with random, I guess. And let's start with a dodgy level or a drinky level. Let's go with dodgy. There are other dodgy levels, a cannon and a drinky level, a park, which are both DLC. Choose your hat. Let's go with the classic top hat. And here, you can only move up and down and jump. You cannot move left and right, even though you're controlling the buggy. You're not controlling the buggy or the character, in fact. You're controlling the hat. See, you can make the hat jump. And your job is to pick up more hats, and then you move up and down the hats, and the light gray one is the one that will jump when you push the jump button. And you can actually jump multiple hats like that. But your goal is to make the hats jump to avoid collisions with pigeons, hawks, doves, uh, boomerangs, beers, darts, and any other sorts of things that might be flying by. You can see your hit points at the bottom of the screen. That line of red is how many hits I can take before it's game over. And the more hats I get, the more points I get. The number of points you get is equal to the n number of the hat you're picking up. So my next one should be seven, because I already have six hats. Yep. There. Now again, you can't move left and right. You're not controlling the speed of your buggy. You can also hold down the shift key to quickly move up and down. That's the only way that key repeat works. Otherwise, if you just hold down the W key, it just goes up one. So this is all being done with the left keyboard. The right shift key does not work for me to uh, move quickly up and down, so it has to be the left shift key on my keyboard. This is the Mac version I'm playing, by the way. I do have the iOS version, but I found the controls a little bit uh, not as intuitive as this. Neither one is as ideal as the uh, joystick or arcade setup that I would prefer, but I'll be chatting with the developer about that shortly. So I really dig the music and art style of this game, even though this game defies description, and I don't think it's historically accurate. It's just, uh, those castles in the background are kind of throwing me up. Whoa, didn't even see that bird. Uh, nonetheless, the game, something about it just seems authentic, if that even makes sense. Whoop. Losing hats left and right here. Just three more to go. Can't even jump high enough to get the newest hats. They're going to bring it down a notch for me. No, not that notch. Whoop. Missed a hat. That's okay. Better to miss a hat than lose a hat. I have no idea how I'm going to ever achieve my high score of Pi. Whoop. And that little line shows me where the hawk is going to come. Oh, didn't help me though. I still hit the hawk. One more hit and it's game over for me. Notice that you don't get any points for avoiding the birds. You just get to keep your hats. But the more hats you collect, the closer you get to unlocking more hats. I just unlocked the tweed. How lucky for me. Alright. So let's play again. Let's try the other mode. 
Challenge and score attack are very similar. Local works for local keyboard or local Wi-Fi. You have to be on the same Wi-Fi network if you want to do it that way. But let's go to challenge. This gentleman right here. And the drinky level. Very similar. Let's go with the Fez. Doctor Who fans represent. This is a lot like the dodgy level, except you get to move left and right. And the challenge mode is the same as the score attack, except there's another guy here. I'm the gentleman in red, and the gentleman in blue is just trying to move faster than me. So in this game, you collect hats by drinking beers, which is somewhat abstract. And whoever gets the beer first gets the hat. Now you can push shift key and left or right to dodge a little bit faster left and right. And again, you can move up and down the hats, and you can hold down the shift key to dodge faster that way as well. Oh, lost a hat. Now instead of a finite number of hits I can take from the kerfuffle in the background, balderdash. Whoops. Went right over my head, as most things do. So instead of hit points, there's a time limit. This game is going on for another minute and ten seconds before it's game over, man. And let's see how many hats I can get in that short of time. Hmm. And unlike in the one-player mode, where it shows you your score, in this two-player mode, it's simply whether or not you have more hats than your opponent. I would say I'm winning right now, although these fezes kind of look like teacups. Oh, darn. Oh, I'm so busy getting that beer, I didn't see the boomerang. However, I do appreciate that with it, uh, at least to a certain degree, every beer you get pulls the camera back a little bit. So you have more of a warning when things are coming from left or right, such as a beer or boomerang. Oh. Six. Five. Four. Three, two. One. Game over, man. Yep. Yeah, sorry. I'm more hatful than you are. I'm the hattier gentleman. I win. 38 wave. 39. Now, see, it doesn't tell me that in the other version. Anyway, so this is a game that is just bizarre. However, this guy is cultured for life with his monocle. Queen and country, he's a gentle man. So let's bring on the developer to learn a little bit more about what they were thinking when they made Max Gentleman. Today I'm speaking with Ryan Wiemeyer of The Men Who Wear Many Hats, developers of Max Gentleman. Hi, Ryan. Hello. This game came out August 21st for Mac, PC, and Linux on Steam and iOS and Android. And how's it been doing for you so far? Um, it's been not doing great. Uh, we have a lot of units out there, but I think we're having the um, space team effect where uh, people don't really seem to buy content very much. Now, this is your first time going with in-app purchases, is that right? Yeah, we wanted to try... Well, the game had a lot of different things you we were trying, uh, and a lot of them ended up getting cut. But one of the things we wanted to do basically was just make a, a game where we would charge for multiplayer because we were testing cross-platform multiplayer, which is for a bigger other game we were going to make. And we ended up cutting that because it didn't make sense because the single player in the game in Max Gentleman wasn't nearly as robust as our original game that we, we were like moving this concept over from. Um, and so ultimately, we ended up with this free experience that only made sense for you because it's multiplayer and you know you don't think your friends are going to spend three dollars to play you know like a two minute multiplayer experience so uh we ended up thinking like all right well how can we make this free but then start, still try to get money and you know we had looked at space team and we know what happened there where it's like super popular very critically acclaimed but it made like no money it made like ten thousand dollars i think which is actually if we can make ten thousand i'll be happy and so we thought okay well we can improve on that by making our stuff a little more interesting uh by having like cooler characters and you know fun art the, the stuff that people really liked about the game and it's not really translating over very well so far well, at the time of this recording, the game has been out for less than a week, so I'm sure it's going to be at PAX Prime. A lot of people are going to see it there, right? Sure, yeah. But, I mean, let's say at PAX, you hit about a thousand people, if you're lucky. We're only doing a mini-booth this time, 
because we have, an, we have a big arcade cabinet that we took to PAX East that did really well. We had a line out of our booth the entire time, and we had prizes and, you know, a giant TV displaying the cabinet, and it was really cool, but this time it's the mini booth because it's... We don't have the time or the money or the resources to get the cabinet out there, and it's just me going this time, so I'm sure there won't be nearly as much fanfare as what I'm used to, because we normally have, like, a full booth at PAX. I imagine that transporting a full arcade cabinet from Chicago to Boston or Seattle must be a real pain in the butt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, last time we did it, and not only that, it's an arcade cabinet that I built, so it's, like, literally made out of super glue and, like, hot glue, and so it falls apart every time we move it. Um, the last time we moved it, luckily, uh, the guys from Iron Galaxy, they do dive kick and a bunch of other stuff. Um, we're friends with them. In fact, my brother works there. Yeah, they, they just had a truck and they offered to load up our cabinet because they had extra room. So that was really sweet of them, but they didn't have a booth this time. So I couldn't, uh, call in any more favors with them and it, it would just cost so much. I mean, it's already costing me like $2,000 just to go to PAX this time for a game that's not making much money. If I get every single person that stops by our booth to buy all the DLC, maybe <laughs> I'll get back the cost of going. Well, sometimes it's also about establishing reputation and cred, and this may, you know, work into the next game that you said you're developing. Yeah, well, so one of the other things about this game, and the reason we wanted to do it free is, originally it was only going to take a few months, um, but we're stupid, so that didn't happen. And, uh, one of the things I wanted to do was just kind of get it out there to, like, bolster our reputation. Like, hey, free game, Flambeer is super great box, right? Like, they gave it away for free on Steam just because they're like, hey, check it out. It's cool, and we make good games. Um, and so, luckily, even though it's not... I mean, my other problem is I'm comparing this game to Oregon Trail, which made us a ton of money really fast. Um, so, we'll see how it goes, but... Well, let's continue talking about finances. This game was funded on Kickstarter, and I was a backer. And you say in the Kickstarter description that the game is going to take thirty to forty thousand dollars to make, but you only asked for five hundred. What were you even hoping to accomplish with such a little amount? We probably only made. I haven't actually. I think we we designed the Kickstarter to make zero dollars. Uh, it was an advertising campaign, right? Like if you look at it, half of it's a joke. The thing is, because it's a Kickstarter, we actually have to deliver on a lot of that joke. So, you know, when people buy body pillows, we actually had to make body pillows. Um, so that was super fun. Yeah, I mean, we didn't think it was fair to ask for money, considering Oregon Trail had done so well. So we thought, all right, well, let's make this really low, make a bunch of stupid jokes, and that will probably garner attention, and it did. And everyone's like, well, what were you thinking? Well, that's so weird. Yeah, and it's, we didn't, I guess we just didn't need that money. And we, we, the thing is, we made very little because all of our shirts and body pillows and all the rewards that was like whatever you back that's like the cost of that item right we weren't trying to normally it's like if you're going to sell a shirt and it costs you ten dollars to make you charge the user twenty dollars well we just charge ten uh, and so that, that was another thing is we wanted to see what would happen if you have like a bare bones kickstarter where items are way cheaper than they are in other kickstarters and you know it worked relatively now this game, Max Gentleman, is nothing at all in any way that I can see, like Organ Trail. Yeah, I mean we also wanted to make an original game, because we still felt a little dirty about making a parody game, and that being so successful, because we have a lot of our own original ideas, and you know, I, I spend a lot of time you know, staring at the indie community and seeing all these great artistic original creations and I you know look at Oregon Trail and I like I'm, I'm super proud of that game it's a very good game and it is definitely our own but I always felt like just like internally people were like oh yeah but that's just a rip off you know so we wanted to make something of our own that was good um, and that's luckily we did with Max Gentleman like it is good people do enjoy it um, it's a very simple game but I, you know it, you can play it for a long time if you want to which is nice let me briefly tell you my own story with Oregon Trail. Having played the free version and having grown up with the Apple II on Oregon Trail, I backed the Kickstarter, got the game, and I loaded it onto my iPad with the ebook World War Z. And those were the only two things I took on a very long flight from Boston to Lima, Peru. <laughs> and every time I tried reading World War Z, I was just bored to tears. Of the two zombie media I had, Oregon Trail was by far the superior one, and I spent the entire flight just playing that game over and over. <laughs> Wow, that's cool. Yeah, I had so much fun with it, but I'm curious, how did that game 
inform or educate your experience making Max Gentleman. For a studio, for example, such as Zaboid Games, which made Breath of Death 7 and then Call of Cthulhu and then yeah. the Penny Arcade games, you can see an evolution in their RPG systems, but I don't see any Oregon Trail in here, so how did making Oregon Trail first make Max Gentleman better? Uh, it probably made it worse. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Because we made a lot of like all the things that burned us on Oregon Trail, we tried to address all at once in Max Gentleman, and that was a bad idea. That so, like for instance, uh, people had complaints about controls in Oregon Trail, and even though I still protest they're really good, uh, I think we made a mistake of not teaching them very well because people just didn't understand. I guess they kept saying, "Oh, it's unresponsive," and it's like, "No, it's perfectly responsive. It's you, just, you probably just don't understand what you're doing." Um, so in Max Gentleman, we spent a lot of time throughout development trying to implement tutorial systems over and over and over again and that took forever because it's also kind of an abstract game like collect a hat get a beer like what or collect a beer get a hat yeah and drink and dodge beers but also collect them and so we had we had some complications there and eventually i kind of boiled it down to like a very light version i decided i would let people discover it on their own um but on top of that we kept trying to figure out control schemes like the one we launched with on mobile, because this is originally an arcade game. So trying to put it on mobile is hard. Uh, so the version we launched with on mobile was, it's completely unintuitive to anyone who doesn't hasn't played it, but if you get good at it, you get really good at it. Um, and that's why I, I made it the default one, but I wanted to give people options. So there's like five different control schemes you can pick from the options in case people really hated it. Uh, and that was again, to try and combat people complaining about controls. But then that meant that we also had to have um, you know, tutorial screens for each of the different kinds. And then on top of that, it's cross-platform. So I can be playing with someone on PC, and so the tutorial screens need to make sense across all platforms. So we have like eight or nine different control schemes that all need different tutorials and different control schemes and, and testing and all this stuff. And it's, you know, we launched on all the platforms at the same time, which was also, I thought would be a good idea. And in retrospect, it might've been a better idea to kind of do one at a time so you can slowly support them in, as you go forward. Um, and so, yeah, it was like kind of reactionary to some of the negative stuff that happened uh, that we tried to take all at once, and I think it was a bad idea. I think my next game is going to possibly be Legs of Void. Like, we've been thinking, um, you know, what something that maybe looks like Oregon Trail again, something that's single player, maybe launching on one platform first, and then slowly, you know, hitting each next platform as as we see how the game does, instead of putting all of our eggs in every basket and launching it all at the same time, because then, you know, you have the bigger potential of losing all those eggs. <laughs> Are you finding that one of the five platforms is outperforming the others? Well, I consider it three platforms, because it's like Steam, iOS, and Android. Frustratingly so, I can't really see... On Android, we can't see the number of uh, in-app purchases properly. And on Steam, we can't see the number of base game purchases properly. They have a bug right now that we're waiting for them to fix. But just based purely on sales, like uh, profit, it looks like Steam is like five times better than iOS or Android, uh, which is actually surprising to me. I figured mobile was more primed to buying IAP, although I like to call ours DLC because I hate the notion of IAP. You mentioned this first being an arcade game, and that's how I first played it at PAX East. Mm -hmm. When I got the Mac version through Steam, I was hoping to be able to hook up a joystick or a controller, but it seemed to be keyboard only. Is that correct? No, there's keyboard or joystick. Um, we do have some joystick controller issues that we are fixing right now, but mostly on Linux. What kind of controller did you use? I was using an Xbox 360 controller. Huh, yeah, it works on our end. That's the other problem. I don't know if this is Unity or what. But, like, we, we have Linux, we have Mac, we have PC, we test on all three, and then we put the game out there, and people have problems with controllers on those. And it's like, what do we do? Like, we don't know how to fix it, right? Because it's like, we've already tested it, and it works on our end. So then we just have to, like, involve those people and send them debug builds and get logs from them. And it's that's all very stressful and time-consuming, and I don't know if it's worth our time considering the game isn't making very much money, so there might be a point at which we have to call it and move on to another game. Because, I mean, especially where I guarantee you most of these people asking for support haven't even paid for anything. You know, it's the free version. Uh, but at the same time, obviously, we, we want to foster a good community. We want our fans to like us, so it's, 
you know, I don't know where we draw that line because, you know, after like a year of supporting Oregon Trail, we had to step back and, and just like abandon the Steam forums and just say, hey guys, you know, we're moving on to something else. We'll check on this, you know, like in a year. <laughs> and that, that always sucks too. And when you decided to move on from Oregon Trail to Max Gentleman, I understand that this game was inspired by a piece of spam? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So this actually, the game idea for Max Gentleman came, I think, even before Oregon Trail. We were in our brainstorming period before the Hats were even a company. One of the members who is no longer part of the Hats uh, got an email that just said Max Gentleman. And we just assumed it was a penis pill email, um, you know, male enhancement. We were like, what? Like, we just laughed at the broken English of that. Like, what the heck is a Max Gentleman? And so then we just started brainstorming. Like, what is a Max Gentleman? Oh, it's like if you take a wrestler, a professional wrestler, a Victorian gentleman, and you put them together, like, what is that? You know, they're like covered in tattoos that are like very polite that say like manners and <laughs> stuff like that. And uh, we came up with like so many different like stories and little ideas like that, but not many of them really translated to game mechanics. Um, and so we had basically come up with an idea for an animation, you know, and we had no artists. So we're like, okay, well, we're going to have to shelf this. But then we later drudged it back up later for a, a game jam to put a game in an arcade cabinet. And that's how Max Gentleman came about as it is now. One of the things I love most about the hat after your games, of course, is your sense of humor, especially as it comes across in your videos, your trailers, your Kickstarters. Do you have some experience with stand-up comedy or community theater? Where does this come from? No. I, nowhere, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, I think, so the first time we did our very first Kickstarter video, we always just kind of wing it. So I was like, well, Mike, my partner, didn't want to talk in the first Kickstarter video for Oregon Trail. And so I was like, all right, well, let's just do like a pen and Teller thing. So he held up little cue cards while I talked, and people thought that was cute and funny. And so then we also did like an, we later did an outtakes reel where we put all of our, all of our stupid stuff that we f***ed up because it took us like four hours to record a five minute video uh and then you know just the next time when we did max gentleman i'm like well, let's let's be goofy about it because when i go to conventions i put on a little bit of a persona i wear a top hat i pitch the game like a snake oil salesman and uh people seem to respond to that so i was like all right well let's, let's take that to the next level and we did our kickstarter video and we did it like that and people really liked it so i was like all right well we obviously have to do this for our trailer too and so it's really just responding to what people like. We actually filmed the trailer twice, and the first time was not funny and awkward and terrible. So it's also about being able to understand when you suck <laughs> and try again. Well, it certainly leaves an impression. It makes you a much more personable company. There are a lot of indie developers out there that you know them from their games, and the people behind them are sort of invisible. But you guys, I mean, you're, you're the hats. Yeah. You know, and you know that's something that you're known for which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to keep that up, because um, I do think if you can make fans who know who the developer is, that's much more useful in the long run. Like, we, I feel like pretty much everybody who bought any content in Max Gentleman are, like, our Oregon Trail fans that follow us. Because they, they've said, like, people at conventions, whenever they see us, they're like, I love you guys, whatever you put out, I'll spend all my money on it, you know? And they're like, I don't even care what it is, because you did such a good job in Oregon Trail or whatever. And those are the kind of fans that I'd want to foster, obviously, you know, because I was really scared making a, a game that was completely different from Oregon Trail. But I want the thread between our games to be that they have a certain level of quality and that they always have maybe not necessarily humor, but, you know, you, you can tell it was made by us. It's personal to some degree. Oh, absolutely. Can you give us any sort of a sneak peek about what you're working on next? Yeah, the next thing is not very exciting. Uh, unless you're a fan of Oregon Trail, in which case it's very exciting. The current plan is to make another expansion for Oregon Trail, and we're going to be porting it to systems that I don't know that I'm allowed to say, but pretty much all of them, all the big ones. And um, so that way when we relaunch on the new systems, we have new content. So you'll want to check it out, and then we should be putting those expansions back into the old versions as well sometime after launch. And then after that, I'm not sure. The financial success of Max Gentleman, or lack therefore of, has made me reconsider our next game. Right now, just a hint, uh, I, change my, I, I change my mind literally every week for the last year, but the idea that I'm dwelling on right now is kind of a wizard version of Oregon Trail, almost. It's not a very good hint, but it it's gives you a good enough idea. 
So it's not going to be the three million dollar Victorian MMO. No, I, w I mean, we didn't get enough money on Kickstarter, you know. You so close though, so close. Yeah, if we had got that money, I would have gone straight to uh, who is it, Volition, that makes Saints Row, and been like, hey guys, I'll give you three million dollars to make a mod for your own game, <laughs> and then. You know, tried that out, which would have been hilarious, and probably they would have said no, but whatever. Well, excellent. I, I'm sorry to hear Max Gentleman isn't doing everything that you hoped it would in the first week, but I hope that it, you know, does well at PAX Prime. Yeah. And continues to gain traffic, and that the next Oregon Trail, I'm definitely looking forward to that, because as I obviously have stated, I'm a big fan. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but thank you so much for this inside peek behind Max Gentleman. Yeah, and uh, hopefully Max Gentleman, I think it will have a decent long tail, because... Like I said, the one thing I am glad about is it is a good game. People do enjoy it, so those usually make money for a longer time. Ask me again in a year how I feel. <laughs> I'll do just that. Thank you, sir. Cheers.